I'm super excited about it. I'm a huge fan of this individual. Kevin Powell, CSS evangelist, YouTuber. Uh, his level of knowledge when it comes to CSS, I don't think um, I've met someone with his level of expertise. I'm really looking forward to this concept. Please make sure if you haven't already, drop a like on this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't, so that way you find all the content um, after this event, but also all of our scaled effort events that we do with Between the Brackets, Google Elevate, and more. Um, though you can also see past episodes of that on the YouTube channel. But uh, without further ado, Mr. Kevin Powell. Hey, thank you so much for the, the awesome introduction. And yeah, thanks, your, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honestly very excited about this. So uh, definitely looking forward to how you explain the differences between Flexbox and Grid. Yeah, so thanks uh, thanks for introducing there. And yeah, we're going to be looking at today the, the differences between Flexbox and Grid and simplifying how we can make sure we're picking the right tool for the right job. And just really quickly before we get into it, um, as Daddy mentioned, I'm on YouTube a lot of the time and I just love talking about CSS. And for me, it's all about trying to help people fall in love with CSS and if not fall in love with it, at least be a little bit less frustrated by it. And I think one of the things that frustrates people is when they're working with the wrong tools for what they're trying to accomplish, which is why I was very excited to be able to give this talk today. And before we dive into all of what we're going to be talking about, just so you know, um, you can get all the slides are at this link here. So it's kevinpowell.co slash devfest2021. And I'm going to be using a few code pens as well. So if you want to follow along with me or just reference back to them later on, um, the links to all of those are there at kevinpowell.co forward slash devfest2021. And uh, while I want to talk about choosing the right tool for the right job, there's also the whole question of why do we even have two tools when they sort of do one thing, right? We're, we're looking at creating layouts. Yet, even though we're looking at creating layouts, we have two different things that can do it. So before we worry about how we can choose the right one, I just want to talk quickly about how we can even decide which one we're going um, or why we have two in the first place. And then we'll look at the strengths of the two of them. Because a lot of people ask me this, why do we have two layout tools? It, it can seem like overkill, uh, but if we're using the right tool for the right job, we can make our lives just so, so much easier. And that's what I want to do for you because I don't want people frustrated when they're making their layouts. I want to make your life as easy as possible and make the decisions on how to choose which one as easy as possible. And we have two layout tools for a reason, even though they both are for creating layouts. And that's because they each have their own strengths. And um, as much as possible, we want to rely on the strengths of those. And that's one of the things I want to be looking at today is, you know, if Flexbox is good at X and Grid is good at Y, and for whatever you're working on, you need to accomplish X, well, then you know, okay, I can choose Flexbox to do that. Or you need to accomplish Y, then you're going to go over to Grid. And also Grid and Flexbox work really well together. So you sort of have to look at it like on what scale you're using it. I'm laying this out in Grid, and then inside of there, you might be using Flex to accomplish something else. So you you do have to be making these decisions, but by knowing the strengths of each one, uh, even though they do have weaknesses, I don't want to focus on the weaknesses. I just want to focus on the strengths because you know you need you know what you want to accomplish. So if you know what you want to accomplish, you know which one is better at that, then you can make the right decision. And this comes down to this idea of tools in general, not just for web development, but tools for anything. And when I was looking things up, I found out there's 33 different types of pliers. At least I found 33 while googling uh, for this. And which is kind of crazy because they're all pliers, but different types of pliers have different purposes. Even though at the end of the day, they're all very similar in tools. Some of them are more robust. Some of them are lighter. Some of them are more nimble. So you can get into smaller spaces. Some are better at cutting things. And this seems to be what happens in general. We start with a very ge uh, general tool or very generic tool. And as time goes on, we develop better tools and or we take those tools and we sort of fine tune them to be better at specific jobs. So it's very similar with this Flexbox versus Grid. Luckily, we don't have 33 different layout tools to choose from. Uh, we only have two. Um, and one of the things that causes a lot of confusion, though, is uh, you often can get the same results with both tools. But that doesn't mean they're interchangeable. At uh, that last one, you know, like you might have a pair of pliers that can get the job done. It's a big, bulky pair. You're trying to get into a small space. It can get the job done, but it doesn't mean it was the best choice that you should be using. Another pair could have been better for what you wanted to do. So certain tools have are especially adapted for specific jobs. 
and that's tools that we use every day. It could be different knives that you're using in your kitchen, whatever it is. It's the same thing when we're trying to choose between uh, Flexbox and Grid for our layouts. The difference is if you're using the wrong tool in the, you, the wrong kitchen knife or you, back to the pliers, you see a nail that's stuck and you're using a plier to try and pull it out of a piece of wood. Once that nail has been pulled out, the job is done. The hammer was down the hallway. You could have walked down, picked up your hammer and used the leverage from that to pull the nail out. But you decided that you, were gonna, you had the pliers with you in your pocket. So you did that instead. You struggled like crazy. It got the job done. It's finished at the end of the day. Yeah, you did a bit more work than you had to and it's, it's done. With web development, our job is never done. Once you put something into place, it's part of a website that's living and breathing and is going to be changing. It's going to be updated. It might have dynamic content. So if you choose the wrong tool for the job, not only did you give yourself more work at that moment, but you potentially are giving yourself more work long term or your team more work long term because you're giving, you know, it's just, it's not what you're not using that tool for what it was supposed to be used for. And so it's short term pain and long term pain. And that can be uh, a little bit annoying. Uh, along the way. And one thing I want to make really clear with this talk is this is sort of the, the most basic thing that you often hear is it's if it's Flexbox, use or if it's a 1D layout, use Flexbox. If it's a 2D layout, then you should be using Grid. And personally, uh, there is truth to that for sure. But the truth there is a little bit different than you might think because it's about which where does the control lie? Do you need 1D control or 2D control? And we'll see that a little bit more in the live examples. Um, when we get into the code, but it's don't rely just on it's 1D, it's Flexbox, it's 2D, it's Grid, because sometimes Grid is really good at 1D layouts and sometimes Flexbox can actually handle something that has multiple columns and multiple rows. So it's, it's true in how the control of those tools work, but it doesn't mean it's true with how the, the layout will look. And if that's kind of confusing right now, don't worry that hopefully the live examples will help clear that up a little bit. Uh, but as I said, I want to focus on the strengths of the two of them, because we know now we want to pick the right tool for the right job, and we want to focus on the strengths of each. So we'll start with Flexbox and the strengths of Flexbox, which is all about intrinsic sizing. And you might not have heard the word intrinsic before, and the live examples will help with that as well. But intrinsic sizing is when it's the size of the elements themselves. Um, and again, we'll see more examples, but this means it's really good for smaller elements and things like navigations, tags. If you have like a blog post that has multiple tags on it uh, or a card that has multiple tags, it's fantastic for things like that. Uh, forms, it can be super useful for, for laying out like the label plus the input, things like that, where you have these small pieces and you want to rely on the content to be doing the job there. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of other things that it's good at as well, but just as a few quick examples. Um, but when I'm talking about intrinsic sizing, what I'm talking about is the width of the elements. So if you have a bunch of paragraphs like this, I put black borders on them just so we can see them. And again, we'll go into the code in a minute. But if you did something like this and you throw a display flex on them, then what happens is they all shrink down. And when they shrink down like that, the first one is actually shorter than the third column there because it's fitting to the text that's inside there. They're shrinking to match the content that is inside of them. That's what intrinsic sizing means. It's letting the content decide the actual size. We're not declaring a width on them. We're just letting this happen. And this is the default behavior. We can overwrite that behavior. But to keep things simple, I think the best way to do that is to rely on the defaults. And then you sort of get into overwriting things and trying to force them to work more how you want them to work. So there we have this intrinsic sizing that's coming. Each element is sort of doing its own thing. And that's why for navigations, it's really, really wonderful. Grid strengths, on the other hand, is on the more rigid control that Grid has. Grid is really good at setting the tone and making things work how you told it to work. So uh, because of this, you often hear that it's better for bigger picture. You have the navigation across the top, the sidebar, the main content, a footer. So you do like your whole site layout, and then maybe in there you're throwing in some Flexbox stuff. And it's definitely really good at that. It's, it's great at doing these large scale type layouts. But because you can get things to go where you want, it's also really good at overlapping content. Instead of using positioning to get things to go where you need them to, overlapping content with Grid is just fantastic. It's also really good for content that needs to be reorganized uh, between different screen sizes. Flex has an order property as well. But with Grid template areas, it's really, really amazing what you can do. And it really simplifies life a lot. 
just be really careful and know the implications because there are some accessibility concerns that come up with reordering content. Um, and I don't have time to dive into what those all are right now, but I just want you to be aware that if you are reorganizing content, do be a little bit careful. Um, and one thing that people often don't look at, and I want to show an example of that today, is actually creating equal columns with grid as well, uh, even if there's no rows involved. Because usually you're thinking, okay, I need columns, I'm using flex, I need more stuff going on, I'm using grid. We're going to see how it's a little bit different than that. And <clears throat> the reason, there, there we go, um, is because of how grid has the control, and it's the parent which has control. And we can force Grid to act in a little bit of an intrinsic way um, if you really wanted to, where it's matching the size of the content. But it gets a little funky, especially if you have more content going on and how it works. And it, it, it becomes harder to play with. Where Grid strength really comes in is when you're setting things up and just telling it to do exactly what you want it to. And so if I did something like this with a display grid, set up some Grid template columns, and they do exactly what I want. They're all the exact same size. And you might be going, Kevin, I wouldn't use 250 pixels. I'd be using something a bit more dynamic. It's still going to do exactly what you told it to based on the parent. So with my Flex container, Display Flex, it just makes it work. The magic happens, but it's based on the content that's inside of it. Whereas with Grid, I'm setting up Grid. I'm saying, this is what I want. And my content is going to fit into those spaces that I've set up there. And I think, the, not surprisingly, the person who said this best from the very beginning was Rachel Andrews. She said this back in 2016 in a blog post. Um, she's sort of the queen of CSS Grid. And it comes down to this decision of working from the content out or working from the grid definition in. And I really, really like how she said that. So content out is Flexbox, where the content is what's in control, whereas grid, you're defining your grid and then placing your content on that grid. So to look at a really, really simple example, we have uh, this code pen that's right here. And on this one, uh, let's just take this off for one second. We'll start with it at a bit more of a basic example where when we have nothing going on at all, everything stacks on top of each other. And then we can come in, oops, let's do that with the display flex. <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. And uh, I want to comment this one out. So we come in with a display flex on it, and then it gives us the columns that we want. And this is all these columns are intrinsically sized because I haven't done anything else yet. So you'll notice this column is, you know, there we go. This column here is bigger than this column here. And this column's probably even bigger than that. And it's all based on the size of the content that was inside of them. We are shrinking at this point because flex allows for shrinking. So things can actually squish and we get some responsiveness going on. But even the size that they're at now is defined by how big they would be if there was no shrink actually going on. I'd love to go into more detail on that if we had a bit more time for it. Sadly, we don't um, on exactly how the algorithm works and figures all of that out. But it's going to let things shrink. And it's going to, the smallest they can get, though, is the length of the longest piece of content in that flex item. So here we have one word, it's allowed to shrink down and fit that word. Here we have a longer word, so the length of this one, the smallest it could possibly get is the length of that word. And that's why at one point it will overflow out the side and give us some side scrolling because that's just how flex works. Unless we want to come in with a flex wrap. And then we can come in with a flex wrap. And now, again, back to this idea of intrinsic sizing. And this is something you might, this is sort of like tags on it that you might see where each one is the size of the content inside of it. And they're all fitting that content, but each one is a different size. They're doing their own thing. They're all independent of one another. And this is really cool and really handy. And then it just works and it goes, oh, I don't have any more space. I'm going to go down here. I don't have any more space. I'm going to keep wrapping. I'm going to keep wrapping until I get to the point where there's not even space to wrap. And now I'll actually start squishing. This is just this wonderful thing with Flexbox where it just works. It just does its own thing. But this is about the only control I can have when I'm looking at the parent of a flex item or a flex setup. After this, if I want more control, I have to go on the children and get that control by going into the children to do different things to them. We'll see more of that in a second. But with grid, when I do a display grid, let's turn this off. We have a normal layout. Display grid doesn't actually do anything at the beginning because we haven't defined any rows or columns for it. By default, it's automatically making new rows, so my content just flows the way it would always flow. But if we want to come in and define some columns, we can. So I can say, I want this to be five columns. 
It lays the content out over five columns, and then it just wraps down and keeps putting content there. But you'll notice a very big difference between these flex one up here and the grid one down here is with the grid one, they're all matching and they're all the same size as one another. The height is determined by the height of the tallest one and the width is, well, I've told them what size to be by one FR. If you're new to grid and you haven't seen the FR unit, it's just, it's using the flex box. It's a flexible container, but it's basically just trying to say, divide the space up equally. So make five call, repeat five columns that are all the same width. Uh, you could, again, come in here and actually give it a very thick size, and then they're all going to be the size you want them to be, but that sort of gets a little bit messy. So we'll go back to 1FR there. Um, though, of course, you can get more complex, and I wish I had the time to dive in here, but we can even use this auto fit, repeat auto fit, and then give it a minimum and maximum size, which can get it sort of closer to this flex box thing that we have going on up here. But again, the flex box, we have a big column, a small column, whereas here, everything is matching with the grid. It's locked into the grid. The children are, the parent is defining the grid and the children are going onto that grid and the content is fitting to the cells that it has available to it. That means, uh, that, and this is where that the 1D versus 2D comes in. This is, they're both 2D layouts, right? They both have rows and columns going on. The difference is the control. These, this set, this row here, so we have four columns here. These are completely independent from here, which is completely independent from what we see here. So the, well, it is, we have one D control. Every row is independent from the other row above and below it. They have no relation to each other. With grid, it's a 2D layout because the rows and columns are all related to each other. This call, this row down here, the columns inside of it have to be the same as the one above. We can't do these funky things like this, these snaking patterns or anything like that with grid. It's impossible. Now you can get a little bit fancier with having spans and doing other things. So you can maybe get something that goes across two columns, but it has to go all the way across those two columns. So it becomes this very big difference between them. And again, if we want more control on the grid, I just stick with my parent and I can keep adding more control. I could define my rows and get more control on that, I'm doing everything on the grid. If I want more control over here, I'm coming in and saying that my flex container and choosing all the direct children. So this is just the direct, choosing all my direct children. And then maybe this is a very common way to get equal columns. So that's going to say they all need to be the same size at the base. It's saying it's a flex shrink of one, a flex grow of one, and a flex basis of zero. But again, we're getting something maybe a bit more similar to the grid because there's no empty space left over. But notice how, once again, each row is independent from the other ones. So my columns are equal on this area. My columns are equal here, but that's all being controlled by the children and not by the parent. So. Here, the children are in control of how the layout's going to look. Here, the parent is in 100% control of how the layout is going to work. So a few use cases, I'm sure you've seen uh, navigations and when we create navigations with things. So with Flexbox, we get, and that's why navigations are always done with Flexbox. Um, because here I've set one up that's very simple and I put some borders just to help visualize things. And if you're playing with this code pen, you can go and just like turn off some of the borders um and and play with it a little bit just so you can see things maybe a bit more clearly but if i tried or if i do with flexbox i've literally we've declared flex flex wrap of wrap and we've put a gap on it and we get this nice navigation that's going to work and it actually just wraps and it's pretty much responsive and it's doing its own thing and this is great the intrinsic sizing that's happening here is exactly what i want i want each item to take up its own amount of space do its own thing and be independent of the other things that are around it. And it's gonna make for a nice little simple layout that just does the job for me. And I'm actually seeing a lot more navigations like this that don't even have hamburger menus or anything. Uh, CSS Tricks, I think, is still using one like this. Um, I'm using it on my own site, but it has a much simpler um, layout on mine. But there, there's big sites that are starting to do this, You know, just wrap stuff and it works. Whereas if I try and recreate that with grid, I've started off here just by putting in this min max auto fit because then at least it's working, but you get these awkward spaces because of how the grid is being defined and because of the relationship where I can't get these unequal columns and these unequal rows where this is really big and this guy's really small. With grid, everything has to fit into the cells that are being defined. And so we're getting this gr rigid grid system and for a navigation, that's really awkward. And if I turn off these visualizations, actually, we'll even see it a little bit more clearly. 
where like this navigation at the top, obviously it's blue underlined links, so they're not super nice looking, but it just works sort of how you'd expect one to work. Whereas over here, like look at the giant space that's coming up, that's really ugly. Here, there's a really narrow space between the service information and the blog because of the length of the text. So you start running into like this unequal spacing that can come up and there's ways that you can actually come in here and start playing with grid to try and recreate that flex behavior. But why would you want to recreate the flex behavior when you can literally get it with two lines of CSS? Display flex or three if you want to include the gap. So with three lines of CSS, you can do it. Whereas if you wanted to try and do it with grid, you're going to be fighting with it. And you're going to be playing with weird properties. You're going to have a max content. You might have to play with other stuff. And at the end of the day, it's still not going to behave the way that the flex one does, which just works. So for simple things like this, where you just need them content to be the size of the content, flex is so, so wonderful. On the other hand, I mentioned that we were going to look a little bit at grid. So here I've set up this um, columns class. So inside of, I have a div class of columns and inside my columns, I have three different articles or three different cards. And that's all we have in there. So three direct children. And if I say I wanted to do a display flex on that, which is often what people do, they go, I want, I have three things. I just want to do a display flex and be done with it. It's an interesting thing. They're not all the same size. You get one really big one and some smaller ones after that. And that's happening because this intrinsic sizing. This card has more content in it, so its intrinsic size is much bigger than the other ones. This max content that we would have on here would be much bigger than that. The shrink algorithm kicks in for flex, and then we get these unequal sizes that they're looking like right now. And then, so if I wanted to fix this, then I have to go onto the children to be able to fix it. And there's very simple solutions like we've seen. But for me, why not this come in? And actually, even if you fixed it, if you have different padding on the different elements, they'll still not be the same size, which is kind of interesting. I could just come in on my columns and say display grid instead. I can say my grid template columns are all the same size, and then I get three equal columns and I don't have to stress about it. And actually, even if I don't have this, they might be, uh, oh no, I have to declare that, I'm sorry. Um, just like that. And we start getting these columns that are coming in and they're nice and equal and everything is working. And that's one of those places where I really find that grid, the strength of grid is, is you want to set up your grid and then the content just gets placed on there and everything is ready to rock and roll. Love that. Kevin, we're, we've got just a few minutes left and we have a ton of questions that have kind of poured yes. in. Um, do you, you want to try and get into a couple of these? Yeah. So just one really, really fast thing, just to, to as a really quick recap, if you want with Flexbox, the children are in full control. And so the, the children really have the control of the layout. They're what's the boss. Whereas if we go into grid, that's when the parent is in control. And I had a member of my Discord that put together this to help people remember. Uh, Flex is sort of like that relaxed parent who's just letting the children do what they need to do. It's just making sure nobody's killing themselves and it's setting this, you know, letting them go. Whereas with grid, it's the really strict parent. It's locking them down. It's living, the like children have to live by their rules. So if that helps it, people remember it, uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah, that's one way we can see things. All right. And by the way, that quote from, you know, Rachel Andrew. Yes. Amazing quote, but she's also speaking tomorrow. So nice. um, yes, that's true. Yeah, you want to catch that. another CSS talk? Make sure you catch that one. She's phenomenal. So we have a lot of questions. I, I'm kind of yes. trying to find um, some good ones. So we have this one by Sabrina here. Can you have Flexbox and Grid in the same CSS file? but using it in different sections of your site? Yes, 100%. Um, Flexbox and Grid actually work really, really well together. So just, I won't do the whole thing, but like here, if I have these little cards that are within, like I have a grid set up to place my items, and then I could make these into like little individual cards, and I don't, I, uh, these tags here. So if I did tags display flex on that, and then I could set those up using flex to go next to one another, and then we could throw a gap of 1M or whatever we need there. So working with flex and grid they're they're best friends they do different things but you can definitely use them together on a site absolutely and so one like big question that it's come up a couple times is when should you be trying to prioritize flexbox use over grid use and is grid preferred over flexbox in most cases grid seems so much more controllable and uniform yeah 
so I've definitely, I went, and I think people from that were around when Flexbox first came out definitely preferred Flex and we'd use Grid for like specific use cases. And slowly but surely, I'm flipping things around and I'm using Grid almost all the time. And then I'm using Flex for these smaller things. And it's really where I need that, intro. like here, I would never use Grid to put little tags like this or to do a navigation just because there I want to rely on that intrinsic sizing and for those elements to be the size they need to be. But for a lot of actual layout work where I need to put things together, I find I'm turning to Grid more and more. That actually kind of answers this next question here. How do you determine when do you want to use Flexbox versus Grid as end user needs a simplistic UI and doesn't want to be bombarded with overwhelming information? Um, yeah. So, I mean, simplistic, I think if you're on a simple enough layout, you can sort of get away with one or the other because Flexbox definitely has, you could do a nice locked in layout with Flexbox. It's just, do you want to go onto the children to start doing a little bit extra work? So like I could say this, this one card has like, you know, you can do a two column layout with a sidebar and a main content area where your sidebar has a locked in value because you, you choose that thing, you know, you set up like it has a width of 200 and it's not shrinking. And then it's going to be locked in at that size. And then the other one maybe fills in the rest of the space. Or you could do that with grid just by setting up your grid columns and saying this column's 250 and this column is 1FR. So there it comes down to sort of how you want to approach it. At the end of the day, if it works on a, a more simple layout, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer necessarily. Uh, but again, for <clears> me, <throat> I'm going more for layout wise, where I want more structure, I find grid is becoming more and more my go-to. And we have this great question here, mm -hmm. SAS versus SCSS versus CSS, which is, who is the best, or I would say, <laughs> which is more your preference? Yeah, so I really like SCSS. Um, I actually started, well, I started with CSS, then I went to SAS, and SAS and SCSS are basically the same, it's just a different syntax, whether you like semicolons and indentation uh, or not. And so I went to SAS first, but because I was teaching and I'd be going back between the two of them, I keep forgetting semicolons and stuff with my CSS and I was mucking things up. So then I just went to SCSS. Um, I really love SCSS, but I think if anybody wants to learn it, make sure you have a really strong CSS foundation, first of all. Um, so we have this question here, I'm not necessarily sure how to answer this one, but it says, it's from Brian Turner. Is it okay to use flex within a flex? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So, I mean, in this case, I set this up using like grid here to do that. And then these flex items inside, but I could definitely, and I've definitely done it where you'll, you need the parent to be, you know, you display flex on something, then you have a flex item inside and you need to use flex in there to space things out or to do something hundred um, percent. Super common. Yeah. So the, this final question that we'll take here is we can mix up flex box with grid. But will it be a nice idea to use child control of flex with grids since grid has parental control and flex item has their own controls or will this give conflicts? Um, so it's just important to remember that. So if you do a display, okay. So when we do display grid or display flex, it's a bit interesting, but they're both inner display values. So it doesn't change on the outside, like display flex or display grid are both block level. And then the inner value will be, uh, so the inner value becomes a display grid or flex. So say we do display grid, the inner thing is grid. So then the children inside that become uh, the item, what is it, grid items. So you have these grid items that are in there. If on one of those grid items, I do a display flex, it's not affecting anything on the outside. It's only looking inside of that one cell and it's going inside here. Now we're living in a flex box world. So it won't like go deeper in. It's, it's always one level deep. So we go display grid, I have I have grid uh, grid items, and then on one of those grid items, I can do a display flex and get the flex box controls in there. So you'll never worry about any uh, any conflicts, anything like that, and it should work just fine. That's awesome, Kevin. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you so much for answering all the questions that we had in the audience as well. And I mean, last callouts, anything that you'd want to share for them to kind of find you, and also will you be tweeting out perhaps your slides? Yeah, I'll put the I'll tweet out the the link back to the slides and again kevinpowell.co slash devfest2021 and people can get them there as well. Um, and yeah, if, I mean my YouTube channel is where I post ninety percent of my content. Um, so if you want to learn more about CSS, dive deeper into any of these topics or just CSS in general, YouTube is mostly where I am. 
Uh, and I'm also on uh, Twitter, Kevin J at Kevin J Powell, because Kevin Powell is a common name. So at Kevin J Powell. Um, and I, I'm pretty regular on Twitter. You can come chat with me. Just I share pretty much everything I'm up to on Twitter. So yeah, I think that's about it. Awesome. Kevin, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun.